Adam, James, Dylan, Eric, Ethan, Peyton, and the latest one, Salvador. This is how I started my first communications class in college last summer when I had ambitions to become a nurse. At the time, I didn't know why I needed a communications class besides the fact that we all need good bedside manner. Looking back now, I see that it was indeed indicative of my life's path that I never would have chosen for myself, but I have found myself in. And that is my advocacy. I haven't been able to get the images out of my mind, as I'm sure so many of you are struggling to right now, reeling from the devastating aftershock of the last two weeks. There is anger. There is deflection. There is denial. There is defensiveness. There is a whole new onslaught of what-if questions that plague our society today and will continue to plague our society. The what-if questions that, unfortunately, in our reality today, are always asked with bitterness and anger and regret in hindsight. I'm not going to proclaim that I have all the answers, but I do have a way that we can take action against this crisis today in this moment. And that aligns with the theme of accountability. I have talked freely of accountability ever since last fall when I knew when I saw a man who looked like me who was disparaged openly a flawed man and a scarred man and a man who had been dealt a great pain and ever since that moment, I knew that this is what I was supposed to be doing. The TED Talk that I am in the process of writing is tentatively called Through the Eyes of an Addict, The Illusion of Accountability. And that is what I want to discuss today without any time restraint, without any pressure, without any script. This is me in my purest form being fueled by my passion and my passion alone. This has nothing to do with personal gain, with publicity, with the monetization of my blog, my narrative works, or anything other than dedicating this post to the 31 lives that we have lost needlessly over the last less than two weeks, having seen their pain and having their questions continually be unanswered. Accountability in our society remains an illusion, not only in family and personal relations, but also in the media, in society, and in the workplace. It is pervasive, it is subtle, and it is hard to detect. That is why I claim passionately that accountability is an illusion. And this is why. Despite the fact that there is evil in the world that continues to seem predominant with the onslaught of media, the fact will always be that people are good. And people will always remain good. The vast majority despite the emphasis on the evil that surrounds us. And because people 
are good at their core. It is difficult to decipher when disparagement, deflection, denial, discouragement, and all of the words that define what it means to suffer in my capacity. As an addict who has largely cast aside my fear and largely cast aside my shame, but an addict nonetheless who is still vulnerable and will always be vulnerable to a certain degree. It has not been easy for me to put myself out into the world in the capacity that I have because I have always been an addict from the earliest memories of my childhood because I have always been addicted to the approval of others. I have always placed my value in other people's hands. And that addiction is the one that I cannot rid myself of in its entirety. The lessons I have learned over the last four years respectively have not been in vain. They have a profound purpose clarified by my own personal belief systems and my own deity. And through my life experience, this talk, this message that I have for you today is not founded in hostility or bitterness or underlying motives of negative sentiment override. Because the reality is, is that it has become so much bigger than just me. I want to focus, although my emphasis has been predominantly on addiction and substance abuse disorder, I feel it fitting and more appropriate to focus on the subject matter of ideation and isolation and exclusivity. There is a TEDx talk out there with the title, Isolation is the Dream Killer. And I will share that title but with a whole different meaning. Because what I have learned through my life experience and the knowledge and the wisdom that I have gained is that isolation and exclusivity is the killer of dreams. And it has been the killer this week and last week of over 31 people. And each and every one of their lives and their ambitions have had dreams that have been cut short in turn. I am not bitter. I am not angry. I do have bouts of anger and bitterness because of my inability to heal. Accountability. I understand. I have a profound and keen sense of awareness of my illness and how it conflicts people and how much of a toll it takes on family and loved ones. Maybe I do not have a 100% firm grasp on the complexities, but I still hold true to my belief that the roots of the destructive internal narrative of people who suffer in my capacity, the predominant reason is because we are all too aware. That is the driving force of our shame. That is the driving force of our punishment and our self-destructive narrative. I know because I have almost lost my life due to my destructive narrative because of my self-punishing behaviors, because of the guilt of my actions, the remorse and the shame and that is what led me to nearly lose my life in 2017, was the internal narrative. We are aware. And we are not ignorant. We are ill. And the first thing that you can do today, if you have a loved one or a family member or anyone that you know who suffers from a mental health crisis, 
whether it be ideation, bipolar disorder, eating disorders, mental health, addiction, or substance abuse disorder, you can do something today. And this is something that people who suffer from addiction and substance abuse disorder do every day, every day, every week, every year, with a 50 to 75% success rate, a success rate that is high despite the physiology of our damaged minds. And what the world needs to understand is that the physiological degradation of our minds are almost always exclusively the derivative of an already psychologically damaged heart and souls that have been maimed. We have no conclusive evidence if Salvador Ramos did indeed suffer from mental illness. There have been newscasters who said he must be because who in the right mind can kill another person in that way? What I do know is that he clearly suffered from ideation, suicidal or homicidal. This 18 year old boy suffered from ideation. And I have no doubt that he spent the majority of his time alone. Whether he chose self-exclusion or not, the fact was he probably spent most of his time alone. And exclusivity and isolation breed ideation. This is something I know from first-hand experience. A lot of people don't know that I suffered from suicidal ideation when I was a teenager. And I will use the next example. Ethan. Last name Crumbly. The Oxford shooting just a few months back and four more innocent lives. And I was particularly rageful because of the negligence. He was 15 years old, the very same age that I was in high school. And we both drew pictures of guns and knives and nooses. We both cried out for help in the best way that we knew how. We both did not have a sound understanding of the deeply rooted psychology behind our actions. We did not have the capacity or the emotional maturity to make sense of our ideation. I certainly know that I did not at that time. But I do remember drawing those images and writing those words and staying behind in math class and dropping it discreetly on the floor where it was found. And to this day, I have no sound comprehension about the complexities of why I did what I did. Only understanding the fundamental roots of human nature. And that is that I felt as if some part of me wanted to be seen and some damaged part of me wanted to be heard. I had written, don't be surprised if you find me cold and bloody in the park. Ethan Crumbly had wrote, help me. The world is dead to me. The voices won't stop. Upon further research, I discovered that via text message through several of his friends, he had admitted openly that he had wanted to go to the hospital, that he knew something was wrong with him and that he needed help. And he said that his father would not take him and to suck it up. This was unprecedented because his parents diverted accountability, not only in a physical sense, running from the law, but psychologically, the refusal of accountability. And it had dire consequences. Four more lives lost. And Ethan, another voice that was not heard despite his attempts to be heard, having no sound comprehension of his actions being fed his destructive ideation, most likely through exclusivity. And it was not his fault that his attempt and that his voice was deliberately not heeded. And I remember when Adam Lanza 
slaughtered 26 people at Sandy Hook Elementary. My two sons were their age when that happened. And I remember when that happened and it was haunting. And I could not get the images out of my head. There was a story where a young girl came out of that elementary school covered in blood. And someone had asked her if she was all right. And she said, I am okay, but my friends are all dead in there. And just now, after hearing about another interview in this latest case in Texas, a father who was an EMT worker saw a young girl coming out of that school, yet again covered in blood from head to foot, he said. And he said, are you hurt? And she said, no, but I just saw my best friend get shot and killed. And he said, what was her name? And she said, Amory. And it was his daughter. It was the EMT's daughter, and that is how he learned of her demise. Accountability. The 12 steps of recovery is something that we are held to be accountable for in recovery as addicts. The first step. And I am going to unlock my screen here because this is not a professional talk. This is just me in my true form and in my true frustration. The first step of accountability in the 12-step program is to admit to yourself that we cannot handle our addictions and that our lives have indeed become unmanageable. We are asked to admit this to ourselves as a fundamental first step of progression, and it is difficult. Rarely does the addict achieve accountability in the first days and weeks and months that follow when they are called on their actions. I know for me personally, I did what every other addict would do, instinctually so, to deflect, to deny, to divert, to distract. And it took me a few months to achieve full and transparent accountability. And I found freedom in doing so. The irony of my story has been that after I was caught on my actions, similarly, I was cut off from all of my addictions in polypharmacy. I had learned upon the research of my narratives that I had been flagged by pharmacies from a 75 mile radius. The jig was up for me and I felt a profound sense of relief. The irony being in my personal story is that I never had to fight for sobriety in the immediate aftermath and the consequences of my actions. The tragedy and the reality was, despite everything that I had suffered in the days and the weeks and the months that had followed and the years, the fight of my life would be to prove to others that I was sober and that I had no reason to lie and that I had no reason to be deceitful. And that is indicative of our reality today as well. Addicts are guilty of making decisions based out of fear. And it is fear that runs our lives and dictates many of our actions. But because of my story, because my sobriety was the one constant in my life that I had held to, that I could cling to, that I knew to be true, the reality was, is that the assumptions and the fears and the accusations of others around me were indicative of irrational, fear-based decisions. And that is the tragedy. Because the world continues to see only what they want to see, and the world continues to hear only what they want to hear. And I am taking a very controversial stance openly, despite my vulnerability in my candor. I am not talking about politics. I am not talking about gun reform. I am not talking about the Second Amendment or our rights. What I am talking about is the people and the damaged souls who wield these weapons. Of course, it is frustrating how they acquire them 
But that is not my expert, my area of expertise. Because these people are damaged. They have been psychologically damaged. And there are warning signs. There are always warning signs if people care to look for them. Ethan called for help with his note and his texts. Salvador, in his own way, recently. He may have not known it, but he did call out for help when he corresponded with that young 15-year-old girl across the world, declaring his actions. He was calling for help. And it may not be interpreted that way, but I am positive that in some way he was. He wanted to be seen, and he wanted to be heard. And for him, and for several people, the desire to be heard and seen is so powerful, so fundamental in the roots of human connection, that they will gain attention in negative and derogatory ways if they cannot gain attention in positive ones. And that is exactly what he did. And we are living the repercussions. But there is more. Because if you hold yourself accountable to the realization that your loved one, your friend or family member cannot overcome their illness on their own accord, you would accept freely one fundamental and critical truth. And that is that exclusivity and abandonment as a means of erroneous reform should never, ever be implemented. For me, it is obvious, and I don't mean to sound inflammatory by suggesting otherwise to you, but the reason why these people are ill, the reason why I was ill, was because we did not have the coping skills, the healthy sense of self, or the emotional means to regulate our emotions on our own. And that is why we are sick. That is why we are compulsive. That is why we are addicted to divert attention away from our pain, the pain that we do not know how to address openly. Because addiction and the behaviors is merely a symptom, is merely a repercussion of the true problem that lies just underneath the surface. And in our society today, people continue to be so repulsed by the coping mechanism, by the behavior, by the action. When I was bulimic, the repulsivity of regurgitating my food and the repulsivity of stealing medications out of desperation and the self-punishing narrative that we always succumb to. It is repulsive, but what the world needs to remember is that it is a psychologically destructive coping mechanism. And as addicts, when we are in recovery, we are admonished to dig deeper, to find the roots of our pain, to find the reasons why we cope in the way that we do. Addiction is a family disorder and it affects family members and friends, and there are repercussions that affect family and friends. And because addiction and substance abuse disorder is complex and multifaceted and multi-generational and does affect everyone involved, it stands to reason that the solution should be family-oriented and it should be worked out together. And this may cause additional controversy because another symptom of the physiological degradation of an addict in their minds is the inhibition of memory in the central cortex of our brain. It is so easy for family and friends to get frustrated and to be angry and bitter that the addict in their life cannot remember all of the things that they have done for them throughout the years, the good things that they have done, the helpful things that they have done. And they are angered by this and defensive by this and put out by this. But another sobering reality of that fact is because of the physiological degradation of our minds. We cannot remember. Most of the time, we cannot remember just how much you've helped us. 
we don't have any comprehension and our minds are blurred. And so we really don't remember. And I understand that it's hard. But as family and friends and loved ones who do not have damaged physiology, who do not have psychologically damaged hearts, and they have intact souls, your chances of succeeding at helping your loved one increases exponentially. The addicts do these 12 steps and they do it with physiological degradation. They do it with psychologically damaged hearts and they do it synonymously with being scorned and shamed and disparaged by society, by the media, by family and friends. In the media, there is a lack of accountability. Upon preliminary research for my books, I had written a speech for my communications class. There was a very famous ad campaign by a production company called Olgaivi. And this was back in 2002, I believe, or 2004. And everyone knows this. It was the Dove ad campaign. And it was a very, very popular ad campaign to emphasize and individualize beauty in all of its forms and to accept differences. And it was very well received and it was very popular. And there was a poster of a woman who was covered in freckles from head to toe. And the poster said, beauty spots or ugly spots. And I resonated with that because I have scars. I have scars of my weaknesses that are on my legs and on my face. And I have learned to accept them as beautiful because they facilitate my narrative and they facilitate my story and they humanize me and make me relatable. And so I feel that I truly am beautiful despite my scars and my blemishes. There was another ad campaign in 2012, the same ad production company in Algaivi, and they wanted to raise awareness for drunk driving, which is very problematic. And alcohol is one of the most devastating addictions. And the name of the ad was called Breathalyzer Karaoke. And you can see what this is going. The purpose was to use shock value in our society today as a means of reform. And the subtitles said, okay, let's have some fun. The obvious insinuation being that, get ready, we are going to get ready to surprise them. We are going to get ready to mock them. And at the time, the ad was dubbed creative and ingenious and fun. And when they discreetly hid the breathalyzer inside the karaoke mic, and so many people who were vulnerable and exposed went up to sing into it, just as so many people are when they are at a karaoke bar, what they thought would be their scores when they were done was in fact their blood alcohol content. And for the vast majority of the world, you may find humor in that. But that is indicative of shock value and shaming in this way. Because if you take the initiative to look up the ad, you can YouTube breathalyzer karaoke. At the end of the ad, what you will see is shock on their faces. And what, what you will see is embarrassment on their faces. And what you will see is shame. And that is shock value utilized in our society today to use embarrassment as a means of reform. And I felt their pain and I felt the injustice of it because I have been made to feel shock value. After my DUI in 2018, I was obliged to attend an awareness panel, which I did, and it was an educational class. I had went to this class when I was pregnant and I was several months along. And there is nothing wrong with trying on drunk goggles where you put them on and you can see something, you know, three feet away or whatnot that's not there. There's nothing wrong with that. But what was wrong was when the facilitator all of a sudden turned on the TV and I was thrown a decapitated body in my face. And I was shown an image of a woman's flesh sliding off of her skull. And I was shown um, a man sliced in half inside the wreckage of a vehicle. And I jumped out of my seat and I screamed. 
and I started crying in earnest, and I was mad. I was mad. Shock value is utilized in our society, and it is common knowledge that you cannot shock someone into reform. You cannot shame someone into reform. And I was so upset. I could not get those horrific images out of my head for days and days in my pregnant state, and it was haunting. And finally, in 2019 and 20, amidst the onset of COVID-19, Algaivi set out a new ad campaign to pay homage to the brave healthcare workers on the front lines of this global epidemic. And they had created an image gallery celebrating humanity. Sweat on their brow, donned in their PPE, with their N95 masks digging into their face. And it was very touching and it really shared a visceral human moment in the eyes of the world. And that was me as well. Because I am a certified nurse's aide and I did transfer into acute care on the onset of COVID-19. And I have worn personal protective gear and I have sweated in it and I have been stained and my face has been scarred and marred and I have subjected myself to all of the risks and all of the dangers of this virus in this pandemic. As a nurse's aides, we do a lot of the brunt work. We do a lot of the turning, the changing, the feeding, and we expose ourselves every bit as much as the nurses do. And yet when I had proclaimed this on a family video, the first comment that a family member made was accusing me of being a narcissist because I had thought that I was a nurse. Um, despite everything that I had passionately declared in my video. After I had passionately declared that I was not a stain on society, that we are a society, her comment to me moments later was to tell me that I had stained the family name and that I had dragged it over and over again through the mud and that I should be grateful that my family hasn't given up on me. Using the very same words, after I passionately declared that I was not a stain, she had called me a stain. I can be all of those things, and I am all of those things. I am flawed and scarred. I am someone who suffers from addiction. And I am a healthcare worker on the front lines of a global epidemic. The reality is they need not be exclusive of each other. More of the steps of accountability progress and I do not have all 12 steps in front of me, but this is the good news. This is something that you can do easily and that you can do today and that you can do with one quick and easy Google search. Because after you come to accept that we are not capable of handling and regulating our emotions on our own. You take off the table exclusivity. And if you implement that one action alone, if you embrace the fact that we are not capable of being left alone to our own devices, the number of incidences will decrease exponentially if you have that sound information, if you hold yourself accountable to the fact that we do not have the coping skills and we do not have the tools, if you hold yourself accountable to step one, your chances of success will grow exponentially. And imagine how much more success you can achieve if you follow the rest of the 12 steps. I believe it's step four, and I don't have um, the list in front of me, that you can make an inventory and a list of all your character deficits and all your flaws. And we are asked to do this. And it's hard as people who suffer from addiction and substance abuse disorder to hold themselves accountable to their worst of moments and their worst of mistakes and their deepest of shames. And it is a difficult step, but it is one that I have succeeded in doing. And I have made passionate amends of forgiveness to the best of my ability with my immediate family relations. But it does not change the fact that I still suffer from deep-rooted feelings of fear and exclusivity. 
that I am triggered because I feel petty for the choices of self-exclusion, because I am afraid, and because I am vulnerable, and because I miss human connection. If you, as the loved one and family, are capable of making an inventory, if you sit down and make a list of the things that you have done to the addict in your life, to the things you may have said that hurt them, to the actions you may have took that pushed them away inadvertently, or the things that you have said that drew them in. And if you consciously reflect and make an inventory and a list to yourself of the tactics and the strategies that you have used that have been successful and the ones that have not, that increases your chances even more. And if you do this daily, because we are emphasized to hold ourselves accountable to daily accountability. If you discipline yourself and dedicate yourself enough to your loved one, to your family member and to your friend to hold yourself accountable daily for your actions and your behaviors and the things that you say and the things that you don't, you will develop a more keen and a profound sense of awareness of your actions, just as we are when we are held to daily accountability. And the sad reality is, is that if we mess up, if we fall down, we are punished and we are disparaged. And even with recovery programs in our society today, addicts are punished when they relapse. They are punished when they fall off and have to start over. And Nora Valco knew this when she made her plea last year. The society needs to change because relapse and falling and failing are indicative of the symptoms of this disorder. And I have fallen and I am sober from polypharmacy, but I have fallen and I've relapsed on over-the-counter sleep aids, on over-the-counter antihistamine. And I have held myself accountable for those mistakes. And I have punished myself for those mistakes. And I do have that narrative that haunts me and tortures me. And it's difficult to quiet the narrative and the tendency to self-punish. And I do know for a fact that the reason I relapse and the reason that I get triggered is predominantly because I feel alone. And I feel unheard. And I feel helpless and frustrated. And I feel devoid of human connection. It was Johan Hari in his TEDx talk, everything you know that you think you know about addiction is wrong when he said the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is human connection. And that is the foundation. <laughs> Skimming over the 12 steps. And as my plea to you today is unscripted, and I don't have notes or tools or anything in front of me at the moment, I can admonish you to look over the steps. And when you get through all of them, when you reach the end, you will see that once you have accepted accountability and once you have learned what it means to be free, that you will take the initiative to share the lessons that you have learned and to share the message with the world and with everyone else who needs to hear it. We do that as addicts um, as a form of closure and a form of healing and it's cathartic for us. And it can be for you too, to teach other people, to teach other friends and family accountability in turn. To realize that addiction is a family illness and that it does affect the family and that it needs to be solved and treated and dealt with as a family.
accountability. As my fluency of thought is ebbing away, I find that perhaps I need not continue. But this is me. And these are my thoughts. And this is how I strongly feel that you can help your loved one today. To dedicate yourselves to seeing the signs to not leave your loved one alone because they can't handle and they can't regulate and they can't make sense of their emotions, especially with ideation. That was the predominant focus of the dangers of ideation because ideation becomes real with devastating consequences in exclusivity. And I did succumb to ideation four years ago when I had been sober from my polypharmacy and when I knew that I was sober and when my family didn't want to believe me and when I was deprived of my children and my family continues to get defensive when I tell this story and they continue to get angered and that is indicative of sharing the very same traits that we do as addicts to get defensive, to get angry, and to deflect. And that is indicative of erroneous behavior. Because I did hang myself in a closet in 2018 five months after um, the incident. And I did suffer from ideation and I was alone and it did turn deadly because when I Googled how to tie a noose um, in the dead of night, when my sister lay sleeping mere feet away to my left and my father to my right, um, what I saw was indicative of the reality that we live in today. It was not literal instructions on how to tie a slip knot. It was a self-help line, and it was a crisis phone number in big, bold letters. And it was an admonition that was unheeded by myself. And unfortunately, it is something that is unheeded by thousands more. And when I took the 12 foot rope in the backyard and strung it over a branch um, and deprived myself of life and limb and pain and feeling over and over again into the night, um, having told this story several times before, I feel no need to go into the details. Suffice is to say that when the branch snapped and I felt my stomach drop along with the rest of me and I could no longer feel earth between my toes. I look into the camera directly and passionately and solemnly share with you the thoughts that floated in my head, um, synonymous with the thousands of others who have been unable to say them. And I can tell you that the first words were shit. They'll never know it was an accident. They'll never know I didn't mean it. I would never do this to them. I would never do this to them. I am sorry. And that is my truth. That is what happened. Those are the repercussions of having voices not heard and having voices not heeded, whether it is Ethan Crumbly, Adam Lanza, Dylan Claybold, Eric Harris, Salvador Ramos, or Peyton. Because I have said multiple times over when a voice is unheard, a voice is inevitably unheeded. And there are things you can do today and in this moment, they are tools that have been around for years. The 12 steps of accountability. Google them, read them, take them to heart, and implement them 
with the person in your life who is suffering, the person in your life who is not being heard. And in this way, you have profound and significant chances of avoiding your own personal what if question that can be just as devastating and just as crippling as my disorder itself. I am Jenny Minor McCombs. I am an addict. And I have said this multiple times over, that my capacity for goodness and healing far surpasses any wrong that I have done as a direct result of a physiologically damaged mind dictated by a psychologically damaged heart and a soul that has been maimed. This is something that you can do. You can take back power. You don't have to feel helpless. And you can do this today. And if you find yourself being angry at my words upon conclusion, ask yourselves why. Why do you feel defensive? Why do you feel angry? Why have my words angered you? And when you reflect as to why you might feel angry, then you will begin to understand accountability because it's not a one-way street, because accountability is an illusion, and because I have lived the repercussions of this illusion. And I have a voice, and I did find it. And it is my profound mission to facilitate the voices of others until they have the strength and the courage to find their own. I am an addict and I am good. And the people you love are good at their core. Try to look past the repulsivity of their symptoms, their coping mechanisms, the means that they take to cover up the real problem. Find out what the real problem is. And if you do that with an open mind and an open heart devoid of anger, you'd be surprised what you can learn. And I thank you for taking the time to watch this video and to remember it is so easy to give in to disparagement, but kindness is life-sustaining. And is, it is the kindness and the little things and the goodness shown in big ways and small that have the capacity to make the most profound of differences. Choose kindness. Because people are good. And people will always be predominantly good. And I want you to like. And I want you to share. And I want you to spread this message with no pretenses of personal gain for me. This is for them. This is for the next family who may ask themselves another what if question or another child being lost. And I dedicate this post and I dedicate this video to the 31 people who have died in the last two weeks alone and the hundreds more that have suffered in the world today. And I pray for each and every one of them. And I pray that whoever listens to this may have the strength 
to utilize action, to not let your resolve fall between the cracks, but to take action. Thank you.